you'll very frequently see the client server model being used to build Linux applications, whether that be your music player in the case of MPD, a clipboard manager in the case of something like CopyQ, a file manager in the case of LF, or even sometimes your terminal itself in the case of something like URXVT. So I thought it'd be fun to explain how this model works and why it's actually so popular to build Linux applications. Now, I will be talking about it in a local context because if you bring the internet into it, it becomes a little bit more complex. And the best way to explain a model like this is by drawing a diagram. So I'm going to draw it with three components rather than two, just because it makes it a bit easier to explain one part of it. So we have the server here, we have the client, and we have the data store. So I'll just go and label those so it's a bit easier to remember what's actually going on. So client and the data store. Okay. So first up, we have the server here. So the server is basically where all of the real legwork of the system actually gets done. Now, in the case of a lot of Linux applications, it may be referred to as a daemon. These words are completely interchangeable. There is no difference between them. Typically, server is just used for online applications, whereas daemon is used for local things, but it doesn't really matter which term you actually use. So in the case of an audio server, it'll be doing things like streaming the audio, locating the files, connecting to your audio system, playing and pausing the audio, things like that. Basically the real legwork of the system itself. Now, if it needs any data that isn't actually located in its own cache, it will actually go and contact the data store for that information. So it'll go and say, hey, data store, do you have this information? And if the data store has that information, it will send it back. Now, in the truest form of this model, the server never goes and directly contacts the client because it doesn't actually need to concern itself with what the client is actually doing. So this arrow should never happen, but in modified versions of the model, this may actually happen. Typically what's going to happen is the server is going to provide some sort of interface that the client can actually connect to and actually request information from. And this interface is going to be a subset of the functionality of the server itself. So the client can't go and modify everything happening inside of the server. It can only work with what the server provides to it. The specific implementation of this interface is completely irrelevant. It might be a REST API, it might be a function library, all it needs to be is some sort of interface for the client to connect to. Now, this data store down here, it doesn't really matter what the data store actually is. It may be a file system, it may be a database, it might be some dude handing you letters. All you need to know is it's something that stores data that isn't cached by the server. So in the case of a music library, it will be storing the songs, it'll be storing the album art, it'll be storing the metadata, things like that. And the last thing we have is the client. Now, there doesn't necessarily just have to be one client. This is one of the nice things about the client server model. So we can just have this one server running and then multiple clients connecting to it, all trying to get the exact same information from it. So typically what the client is going to be concerned with is displaying information to the user and providing a way for the user to actually interact with the server. And then it will delegate any work that needs to be done to the server itself. Obviously anything that isn't directly related to the UI itself. So it's not going to delegate, you know, generating a list or something like that. It's going to say, give me the information I want for this list. And then it will generate the list itself. So some of the things it might do in the case of a music system is show the player state, show the song that's playing, show the position in the song, and show a list of songs available. Now, unless there's some authentication involved, the server doesn't care who or what is connecting to it. So for example, this could be a GUI client here, and this could be a terminal client. The server, it doesn't care what it is. All it cares is some sort of client has connected to it. Now, sometimes a client type will be sent to the server, but this isn't actually required for the model. The issue with doing this is it does actually tie the server to certain types of clients. So typically you shouldn't be doing that. Now, if it isn't clear from my amazing artwork here, this is basically the logical conclusion of separation of concern. So each part of the system only cares about its specific parts. So the server isn't concerned with how the information is displayed. All it cares about is doing server things. The client isn't concerned with how to actually find the files. It's only concerned with how to actually display the information. So this fits absolutely perfectly into one part of the Unix philosophy, which most people have probably heard. It is design programs to do one thing and to do it well. And you can go see my full video on the Unix philosophy up on that corner. But by keeping that in mind, it's obvious to see why it's still in heavy use today. One of the other benefits you get here is you only have to make the server once and then you can make as many clients as you want. So I gave an example before, but let's say you wanna have 
MPC as your CLI music client and NCMPCPP as your terminal client and Lollipop as your GUI client. All of those will connect to the exact same server. There's no need to have the GUI MPD server and the terminal MPD server and the CLI MPD server. They're all connecting to the exact same MPD server. So assuming that server works correctly, this takes a massive load off of the developer's back. And because they're connecting to the same server, data sharing is basically assumed. So for example, let's go over to LF and let's say I delete this file down the bottom here. So if I delete it from this window here, it's also going to be deleted from this window over here as well. Now you might need to go and refresh the window over here, but because it's connecting to the same server, it will actually synchronize those changes. And along with that, you get the advantage of shared background resources. So in the case of something like URXVT, there might be certain libraries that need to be loaded in for every single instance of your XVT. So instead of having to load them in for each individual instance, you can just load them in in this one instance and then share them to whatever clients actually need them. And this makes it so you have a bit less memory footprint. It might be more in the case of just one instance, but in the case of a sensible client server implementation, it should become beneficial once you have more than one. In the case of a local application, it should probably become beneficial after two or three because any more clients than that and you're starting to get to the point where it's probably never going to happen. Now this doesn't mean that the client server model is perfect. One of the problems it has is you cannot optimize the server for the client. You can optimize the client for the server, but not in the other direction because the server has no idea what client is actually connecting to it. Now I did mention that the client can sometimes send some metadata to the server itself, but without having an in-depth knowledge of what the client is actually doing, you cannot make some of the optimizations that are possible with some other sort of design methodologies. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. This does mean the server isn't going to be reaching into the client and looking directly at what it's doing. So this does separate your concerns in a much more stricter way, but it does come with a bit of a performance degradation. And without having some sort of recovery method, if the server goes down, it's going to bring down all of the clients with it. So for example, in the case of MPD, if you have Lollipop and MPC and NCM, PCPP all running, and then MPD crashes, all of them are going to lose the ability to play music. Whereas if all of them had the server capabilities built into themselves, that wouldn't be an issue. Now this can be addressed by having a separate process that watches the server, and if the server crashes, then it relaunches a new server, but this isn't part of the basic implementation of the model. And if you look at the client serve model in the case of an internet deployed solution, so for example, you have your web browser and it connects to a web server, there are some issues about security and server load that do need to be brought into it as well. However, if you're just running a client and a server on a single computer, that's not really something you ever need to actually worry about. Typically, you're never going to have so many clients that it actually overloads the server. So hopefully that gives you a good idea about how this model actually works and why you might want to use it for not just Linux applications, for any sort of applications out there, but why in particular it is popular in the Linux sphere. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Corbinion, Andrew, Craig, Nathan, Montezar, Chico, Bento, Joseph, Pirati, Rode, Tony, Brennan, Donald, John, Marek, Mikkel, Nate, Dog, Nephite, Tease, and Zilva. If you want to go and support my work, there's links down below to my subscribe star, Patreon, Libra Pay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere. And this channel is available on Library, Odyssey, BitChute, and BitChute. If you want to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me and I'm out.